All right, as you, many of you, most of you know, we have been going through the parables specifically in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are still in Matthew chapter 13, which is loaded with parables. And we are going to, as I mentioned in the prayer, discuss another three of them tonight. We're going to read Matthew 13, verses 44 to 50. Verse 44 to 50. That's on page 1519 in your pew Bibles, otherwise the words will be on the screen. This is Jesus teaching his disciples. He says, <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again... The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have been looking at uh, the parables in Matthew 13 for a couple of weeks now. We got one more week to go. All of these parables focus on the kingdom of God. And so in these parables, Jesus is explaining to his disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he is describing specific aspects of the nature of the kingdom, particularly in this present time, in the present time of the disciples and still in the present time for us as well. And the reason why he does this, his purpose in teaching these parables and these different aspects of the kingdom is to help them to understand the nature of this kingdom that they would soon be sent out to proclaim to their friends and their neighbors and to the world, to the ends of the earth. I think that you all see the logic in this, that it wouldn't be good to send someone out to proclaim a message that they didn't understand. And so the disciples need to understand the nature of God's kingdom. And so in these parables, Jesus is explicitly reemphasizing certain aspects of the kingdom that actually he has taught them previously. In the three short parables that we have today, Jesus reminds us of three things. First, he reminds us that the true worth, the true value of the kingdom is hidden to some. Second, he reminds us that belonging to this kingdom is worth more than anything else we could imagine. And third, he teaches that the kingdom, though mixed in this age, will be purified on the day of judgment when he comes again. And you know, if we are truly citizens of God's kingdom, these truths will make a practical difference in our thoughts and in our actions and in our attitudes and in our priorities here and now in this life. Now, I just want to mention this in passing, but Jesus is uh, speaking these parables directly to his disciples. Now, earlier in the chapter, we, we know that, that the disciples had asked him to provide an explanation for one of his parables, the parable of the sower. And we also know that Jesus volunteered an explanation of yet another parable, the parable of the weeds. And I want you to know that these parables that we read this morning come after the ones that Jesus very de in a very detailed way described to his disciples. This indicates to me anyway that Jesus shares these parables um, 
to the disciples privately. So, so a couple of the parables in Matthew 13, he, he tells to the multitudes, and later on he pulls the disciples aside and explains them. These parables seem to be specifically directed at the disciples. This is probably a smaller group that Jesus is telling the parables to. And in the first one, Jesus tells a parable of this treasure that has been buried and hidden in a field. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and then hid again. And because of his joy over the treasure he had found, he goes and sells all that he has so that he can buy that field. The story focuses on this guy that while doing some kind of work in his field, unexpectedly comes upon a treasure. And when he comes upon this treasure, he recognizes that it is so valuable that it's worth more than the field itself, and it's, it's worth more than everything else that he has or could ever hope to have. And so he goes to work. He gives away everything that he has in order to purchase this field that contains this treasure, and he obtains it. And so in this parable, just very simply speaking, we learn that the true Christian, the true believer, sees the value and the worth of God's kingdom, even though it is hidden to the sight of many in this world. And you know, as Jesus tells these parables, and as I have reminded you before, he tells this parable to kind of, kind of give the disciples a bit of a corrective because they have these expectations of God's kingdom that are not quite right, and Jesus needs to prepare his disciples by, by correcting those misinterpretations or those mis-expectations so that when they go out and proclaim the kingdom, they are doing so accurately. And in this parable, Jesus is trying to cor correct the, the misunderstanding that, that the kingdom would be very obviously valuable to, to everyone who saw it, to everyone who came upon it. See, the disciples expected the people of Israel in particular to be already diligently seeking after the kingdom because it was so valuable. But listen to what Jesus says. He says the kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. And a certain man comes upon it unexpectedly while he was digging, and he sells everything he has in order to buy the field. But Jesus indicates that the treasure is going to be hidden to many. Not all are going to see or acknowledge the value of the kingdom. Not even all those in Israel would be able to see the value of the kingdom of heaven. And so I want to just kind of pull out three little things that I want to make sure that you notice in this parable. First, that the treasure is indeed hidden. It's not openly displayed for all and not all see the value of it. Secondly... I want you to notice, because this is interesting, that the treasure is found unexpectedly. Now, this man was not digging in the field in order to find treasure. He was digging for something else. Maybe he was just plowing the field. And he happens to just kind of stumble upon this treasure. So he wasn't even looking for it when he found it. Third thing I want you to notice is that this treasure is worth everything. Jesus indicates in this story that there is nothing in this man's life that, that can match the value of the treasure which he has found. Of course, what Jesus is saying here in the parable of the hidden treasure is the reality, the truth, that the value of salvation is so exponentially more valuable than any else, that it's incalculable. The treasure that we have in Jesus Christ, the treasure of salvation through faith, is the most important thing to those who discover it and obtain possession of it, some of us without even having have looked for it. So, 
One thing that I was thinking this week is that, you know, a parable like this, and, and also it applies to the next one as well, is that it, 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 it provides a, a good diagnostic for our hearts. A parable like this forces us to ask ourselves, you know, what is the kingdom worth to me? Or is the kingdom my priority? Because biblically speaking, in, in Jesus' own words here, our estimation of the kingdom's worth tells us whether or not we are actually in the kingdom of God, and that's a pretty important thing. If we do not value the kingdom as the greatest treasure, if we do not value a, a saving, eternal relationship with Jesus Christ above all else, then we have cast our lot with all those who haven't seen the treasure and who haven't recognized the true value of the treasure. The people who have refused to uh, give away everything else they have in order to obtain the treasure. Commentator William Hendrickson says it this way, and I think it's beautifully worded. It says the point of this parable is that the kingdom of heaven the glad recognition of God's rule over heart and life, including salvation for the present and for the future, for the soul and ultimately also for the body, the great privilege of thereby being made a blessing to others for the glory of God. All this is a treasure so inestimable and precious that the one who obtains it is willing to surrender for it whatever could interfere with having it. It is the supreme treasure because it fully satisfies the needs of the heart. This is the one needful thing. This is the one thing that satisfies. This is the one thing that we need and nothing else matches up to it. Very well said. But just because it's very well said doesn't mean that you own it. And so I ask you this question again. Does that accurately describe the value you put on Jesus Christ and his gospel? Or is it just one among a number of other things that are significant to you in your life, something, something that you place alongside of other very good and important things? Is it the one thing? Is it the one priority? Is it the treasure of your life. Now, the Apostle Paul serves as kind of a, a living illustration of this parable. Consider what it says in Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9. This is Paul writing to the Philippian church. He says, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So Paul gives us a little glimpse here of the aftermath of his conversion. Remember, Paul was on the way to Damascus, um, uh, intent on persecuting Christians, and then unexpectedly he encountered the treasure, or the treasure encountered him, however you want to look at it. But he rightly saw the value of the treasure, and he gave up everything that he had and everything that he was, actually, in order to embrace that treasure. And Paul literally did lose everything. He lost his career, he lost his reputation, he lost his family and friends. Ultimately, he lost his life, but he was ready to give it all. Not only to give it all, but not to have ever regretted giving it all either. In his eyes, everything that he had given up was worthless in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ as his Lord. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, perhaps some of you have read Knowing God, tells the story of a colleague who, uh, because of his commitment to, to Jesus Christ and, and his Christian principles, had lost the possibility of ever advancing 
in the British university system in which he, he served. He was never able to get to the point of being a, a higher level professor because of his faith in Jesus Christ and his, his profession of Christianity. Anyway, Packer tells the story of walking in the woods with his friend one day, and he asked him if he had ever regretted that decision. He ever regretted that decision, whether he kind of even resented what had happened to him, the, the glass ceiling that had been put in place for him because of his faith. And his friend's response was simply this, I have known Jesus Christ and they have not. He was happy to have foregone the advancement of his career because he did have the most important thing, Jesus Christ, and he knew it. He recognized the value of the treasure. How many of us can honestly say that about our relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, I'm not making excuses. I'm just naming what needs to be named. There are so many things in this life that are pulling us and begging us to be the priority in our life. It may be friends and family and relationships. It may be success and wealth and status. I mean, there are so many things that are vying to be the treasure in our lives. But Jesus says that his people, the people that he has called, the people that the Father has given into his hands, true believers, will see the value of his kingdom and they will be ready to give up everything else they have in order to obtain it. So moving on, the parable, the merchant seeking pearls, Jesus emphasizes this point again. The truth that the, the true believer values the kingdom above everything else. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And so Jesus tells the story of this merchant who deals in precious jewels and stones, who was actively seeking for, you know, the, the best pearls that were out there. And one day he comes across absolutely the most beautiful, the most perfect, the, the most wonderful pearl he had ever encountered. And he realizes, you know, in order to, to purchase this pearl, in order to, to get this pearl, it's going to cost the sum total of everything else that I have. Well, the man doesn't hesitate. He buys the pearl. And again, this parable is designed to make a point to the disciples and to us about the kingdom. I want you to remember, Jesus is teaching his disciples and us about the nature of his kingdom, and much of what he has been telling the disciples is coming as a big surprise, because they have been expecting this kingdom to come in this great, majestic, and glorious way, and yet Jesus says in a different parable, you know what, it's, it's going to come in a, in a very humble form. They also anticipated that all people in Israel would immediately recognize the value of the kingdom, but Jesus tells them that the kingdom was gonna be hidden to some and underappreciated and undervalued by many. At the same time, and we see this in the parable of the merchant seeking pearls, Jesus wants them to know, look, even though my people have by and large not recognized the value of the kingdom. Even though my people have despised me and despised my message, I want you to know, do not be in doubt that this is the most valuable thing in the world. You have rightly recognized that this is to be the priority in your lives. There is nothing more valuable than the kingdom, and Jesus' true followers would know that. Just like the man digging in his field, just like the merchant seeking pearls. And after finding that one pearl of great price, 
being willing to give up everything else in order to obtain it. But I want you to notice a couple of things about this parable as well. First, in this case, and this is very interesting, the merchant is actually seeking for a treasure. He is searching for a pearl, and he finds it. Now, in the parable of the treasure hidden in a field, the the guy digging doesn't even know it's there. In the parable of the pearl, there is an intentionality. The merchant is looking for a treasure. That's got to tell us something. Well, I think that it tells us that it is God who is the one who is responsible for initiating initiating the treasure being presented to someone and also the one initiating that person having eyes to see the treasure and actually seeing the value of the treasure. And God says, you know what? It's not just the people that are seeking for the truth. It's not just the people that are, that are searching for answers that the gospel is going to hit and transform. Some people are not going to be looking for anything. They're going to be perfectly happy in their lives. They're going to be going along, minding their own business, not searching for anything, and the gospel will be proclaimed to them, and they will have their hearts melted, and they will respond to it. I mean, talk about how wide God's grace is. Indiscriminate as he sows the seeds of the gospel of his kingdom. So that's the first thing I want you to notice. Second, I want you to notice that the merchant too treasures this uh, pearl above everything else and that he is willing to, to acquire the treasure at great personal cost. Yes, Jesus teaches again that all who are true citizens of his kingdom will be given eyes to see the value of his kingdom and they will seek first the kingdom of God. I want to include another quote from another commentator, J.C. Ryle here. He comments on both these parables. He says, these two parables are meant to teach us that people really convinced of the importance of salvation will give up everything to win Christ and eternal life. Those who have truly seen the kingdom, those who have seen its value, those whose hearts have been made by the grace of the Spirit to see the value of the kingdom, the value of salvation, the value of the Lord Jesus Christ are ready to give up everything else for it. That said, we all know people who are interested in the kingdom something in their lives holds them back. Maybe some of you are among those people who are interested in the kingdom, interested in church, interested in the gospel, interested in this great gift of salvation that God has presented to humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. We all know people who are interested, but there's something in their lives that is holding them back. We all know people who kind of want to be on both sides of the fence. They want the kingdom, but they want to hold on to their worldliness too. They want the kingdom, but they want to hold on to their materialism too. They want the kingdom, but they're not willing to let go of this sin that they continue to pursue over and over again, even though it leads to destruction. And you know, as sinners... We all have things that pull at us, that we are in danger of valuing more than the kingdom of God. And so these parables, in a very personal sense, force us to confront that in ourselves and force us to ask the question, who do we love the most? What do we seek for first? And there are significant implications to the answers that you give to those questions. And this explains it well. The final lesson Jesus teaches in today's text is that the true Christian realizes that the kingdom, now imperfect, will be perfected at the time of judgment. In the parable of the dragnet, 
Jesus revisits what he taught us in the parable of the weeds. He reminds us of the mixed character of our present kingdom, that good and evil are raised up together. And, you know, remember that corrected the disciples' misunderstanding that that the kingdom, when it was established, would immediately be pure and righteous. But no, again, Jesus corrects that expectation. But along with the reminder of the the mixed nature of the kingdom presently, Jesus again points to the final judgment as a word of promise and as a word of warning. And I think that by repeating that in this parable, by circling back around to it, he is is placing another certainty and another level of urgency on that certainty of the final judgment. So we live in a mixed kingdom. And as we said in the parable of the weeds, for now, our job as followers of Jesus is to focus our attention on the proclamation of the gospel. Proclamation to those who are seeking for the treasure like we saw in the parable of the pearl, proclamation to those who don't seem to be seeking at all, which is the parable of the treasure hidden in the fields, we are to proclaim the gospel indiscriminately, understanding that we do not rest our salvation on church membership or some previous decision or profession that we've made, Our salvation, our confidence is based on a current, living, active, vital, saving trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It is in embracing the king and embracing his kingdom. That's where salvation and assurance are found. And so, is your relationship with Jesus Christ and citizenship in his kingdom your treasure? That's the question I leave you with. And brothers and sisters, whatever blessing, whatever good thing that you crave more than Jesus Christ, I pray to God by the power of the Holy Spirit that he would give you the power this day to slay whatever blessing or good thing that is, to give all for the sake of the kingdom and by life and word to persuade others to do the same. Amen. Let's pray.